Okay, great. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Insull, who is currently a professor at the Institute of Cancer Studies at the University of Glasgow. Professor Insull did a PhD in developmental biology at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, and then a postdoc at the Johns Hopkins Medical School. He returned to the UK as a welcome uh, career development fellow at the University College London, uh, followed by an MRC fellowship, senior fellowship in Birmingham. Uh, he went, went on to become a group leader at the Beaton Institute of Cancer Research in Glasgow. And his research group brings together multiple tools uh, from mathematical modeling to cell biology and biochemistry to improve the understanding of how cell migration is controlled, uh, where he's offered over 150 papers in that area. So on behalf of the Methods for Biological Modeling subgroup, we're very thankful to Dr. Insall for giving this keynote today uh, and sharing some of his research insights with us. Uh, and just as a reminder, please hold all questions until the end of the keynote. Uh, but if you ask them in the chat window, I will make note of them in the order that they came. And then I'll read those to Dr. Insull at the end of his talk. All right, thank you. Good, thank you. Have you switched to me? I shall bring my tea here as well. This is a, a very still life way of having a meeting. Um, I will not be able to see myself. Um, John, while speaking, so please tell me if I come out of frame. It's a little bit unnerving uh, part of this. I will now switch to the. I have to do it the other order, don't I? I will now switch to the talk, which I do by sharing. And I will now. To keynote. Is that visible? Oh, can yeah, you now can. see the screen or can you see just me? So we can see it and there's also a little appearance window. Um, that's not very good. I'll try a different way. We don't really want that. Nobody has quite got used to Oh, I can't make it go away. How irritating. I'll give it one more try. And hopefully that will. Looks great. No, it's it's also now giving me an advanced window that I shall have to get rid of somehow. So can you see that fine? Yeah, that looks fine. I think we'll go with this then. So um, uh, thank you all very much indeed. It's, it's an enormous pleasure to do this. I was um, so disappointed when the real meeting couldn't be cancelled. Um, as uh, many of you will already know, um, I'm um, a, a straight biologist that has converted over 12 years with uh, lovely help from a number of mathematical collaborators and colleagues. And I think I'll probably thank those first before going on to talk about gradients and paths and mazes and chemotaxis and negative chemotaxis. Um, so um, thank you first to people. I hope nobody's got lost behind that. Um, my um, uh, introduction to doing all of this mathematically came when I moved to um, Glasgow and I started doing collaborations with, um, uh, in particular, John McKenzie in the University of Strathclyde. Um, and that has uh, really opened up just about everything that you see here. Um, the work that I'm gonna do, that I'm gonna describe today, has by and large been done by two mathematicians, Luke Tweedy and Adam Dowell, and one clinical fellow, uh, Andy Martin. Um, uh, what I hope you're going to see um, is that everyone does everything. Um, we have found that um, uh, the mathematicians do better math um, when they gain their own data, and the experimentalists do better experiments when they make models to understand what's going on. 
Um, I'm also going to show towards the end uh, some delightful microfluidic mazes uh, made by Michele Zanioni, also in the traffic light. So thank you to everyone, and thank you to all these other people who've helped with bits of it along the way. Um, it's been terrific fun. Now, everyone but everyone uh, has seen this movie. This movie predates the um, digital age, uh, was taken in the 1950s with a big old microscope, big old camera on the top, and it took a photograph every few seconds and then made a great clanking noise as it wound new film onto the spool. It's absolutely astounding, but nobody has ever managed to better this because it gives such a narrative. You look at the neutrophil, which is the eukaryotic cell in the middle, and you know it's a real neutrophil because of all that blood, all of those red blood cells around it. And that neutrophil is chasing a bacterium, and you can see the bacterium at the end. And you can sort of smell the fear in the bacterium, and you can taste the chase of the neutrophil and uh, chases it. Um, and about now, it catches and eats it. And everyone shows this movie as the prime example of chemotaxis and how wonderful eukaryotic cell chemotaxis is. Um, but it always causes exactly the opposite sort of response in me. I wonder how on earth is it possible for the information to come from that bacterium to give such a specific response in that neutrophil? How is it thresholded? If that bacterium is actually secreting something attractive, and I'm not sure it is, because why would a bacterium secrete something attractive in order to be eaten? But if that bacterium is secreting something attractive, then how does it make a pseudopod at the front and not anywhere else, even though there's going to be masses of attractants diffusing everywhere else as well. Um, how does the cell deal with all the stochasticity that's going to be caused by bumping into those red blood cells and changing its shape and the bacterium bumping around? Um, its response is so perfect and its information so accurate, but it can't do that. The amount of randomness it's got to deal with is humongous. Uh, and above all, how can a cell deal with the sort of signal to noise ratio that you could conceivably get out of this? There's all sorts of stuff going on in this movie. How does the cell focus so laser-like on catching that bacterium um, and ignore everything else that's going on? Um, and the answer is we have fixated for ages on the mechanism of chemotaxis, meaning how cells make pseudopods and how cells use their receptors, but we haven't fixated on the information and the information is actually the really interesting thing, I think. Here's another example. On the left there, you see an embryonic mouse. Embryonic mouse are white. They don't have any skin pigment. What happens is that the skin pigment cells migrate out of the neural crest here, and they migrate round through the skin to the front of the cell. Some of you will have seen Luke Tweedy's talk this morning, where he talked in much more detail about some of this. Uh, and it's a lot of his work I'm reporting. Um, but the question is, how do they know? How do they get their direction to come all the way out from the neural crest, all the way around the body, and then all the way down the arms to the tips of the fingers? You might hypothesize that there's a chemoattractant at the tips of the pinkies of this mouse. So there's a chemoattractant there, but that's stupid. That's not what's happening. Um, uh, you, you have a great big robust mass of loads of cells moving in a sheet. They're not chemotaxing to a point. There's something much more interesting going on. Um, and in collaboration with Laura Macheski in her lab, um, we actually got able to show this in a living embryo. And you can actually see that something much more complex is going on than all the cells coming around. The cells right at the wave at the front, the cells nearest the digit here, this is the shoulder of the mouse that's showing here, those are moving in a directive front fashion down the limb, but the others are all moving randomly. Those ones shown in yellow have no direction at all. So the information that is making those pigment cells, those melanoblasts, move around the mouse is a complex and interesting thing and not obvious at all. So where is that information coming from? There's another hobby horse I have in all of this, which is the, the idea of pathways and upstream activators and downstream effectors. So if there's a, a process X that you're interested in, what biologists always tend to do at the moment 
is say, this process X, we can find what's driving it. We can find the downstream effectors, the things that it's driving, Y, and we can find the upstream things that are driving it, that are W. And if we understand those, then we actually understand the mechanism. Um, this is what biologists say, and it's crass. You can keep adding to that pathway and making it longer and longer and longer. And all you are doing is turning the same thing into a more complex process with the same amount of information in it. Um, you're not finding out why X does what it's doing. You're just saying, actually, X isn't interesting. It's W that's interesting. And then you're saying it's not W that's interesting. It's T that's interesting and so on. Add infinitum, add infinitum. What we want to know is where the information comes from. When those cells move, what tells them where to move? And just saying that someone else did it is kicking the ball up the field and tells you nothing. So the pathway alone is not a mechanism. It does not give you any information. It's just an excuse. OK, um, let's talk about some biology rather than ranting into a webcam. Um, the place we started was in the Beetson Institute um, in Glasgow. Uh, and I came working on cell migration and dictus telium. And it was an absolute condition of me moving here that I would never have to work on cancer, even though it's a cancer institute. Um, they headhunted my wife, and I was supposed to be free to keep doing my stuff. But as soon as I got here, you start seeing that actually um, cell movement is just as important and just as interesting in cancer as it is anywhere else. Um, uh, and I got very interested in melanoma through Andy Moynan and Martin. Um, uh, and I got very interested in the information in melanoma. So the thing about melanoma is it spreads. Melanoma is a terrifying cancer. You have a lot of people with breast cancers, for example, that get very, very large indeed. You get people with colon cancers that get so big that it blocks their complete gut by being physically there, being that big. You don't find people with melanoma that big because melanoma is so spready that by the time it's got anywhere near that big, it's spread all over the patient and killed them. Um, so um, something different is going on from melanoma. It's frightening and spready. And when you look at it, like this one here from the NHS website, you can see what the problem is. Uh, any of you SMB mathematically oriented people will see this is not a cell that has um, started dividing when it shouldn't there in the middle and started growing and moving randomly. Because if that happened, you would see a Gaussian. You would see lots of cells there in the middle. And then you would see a diffuse, more or less round edge out here. But you don't. These cells are all actively spreading out. There's actually more cells out here than there are in the middle. Now, the only way it's possible for you to spread out is if you know where out is and where in is, and you spread from in to out. So we asked the question, what is this information? Um, and there is a lovely assay um, where um, we use a chemotaxis chamber. This is um, a 0.6 micron bridge. Um, and um, there's a well here, which we've put serum in, 10% serum. And there's a well here that we've put no serum in. So between here and here, a static gradient gets set up and which cells can read. Uh, and then we put some cells in here and we watch what happens. And what happens is really quite scary. Oh, that is disgusting herbal tea. That it's all that was here. Uh, what happens is quite scary, which is that the cells are not only very, very chemotactic, but they move very fast and very accurately. What you're seeing here is, in essence, what kills someone if they have melanoma. The cells from the melanoma do what you are seeing here in the screen and spread from the melanoma into your bloodstream and through your body. Um, it is very frightening. I went and got all of the black spots on my body checked out when we started getting these assays because they really are actually frightening. OK, so um, that's all very good. The reason that these um, 
uh, melanoma cells are spreading from the center of the tumor here to the outside of the tumor here is that there's a chemotactic gradient of something that's found in serum, right? Sorry, but then Robert, you have to ask the question, to why? Interrupt you Who's real quick. Gradient? We can't tell where you're pointing on the screen, just so you know. Can you see, you can't see now? We can't see your pointer now. Oh, well. Um, I'm gonna stop and um, go back then because, um, thank you very much for telling me, John. Um, uh, it's very hard to... I think we could understand your talk. We just could I know, but pointing. it's only gonna get, only gonna get worse. Um, We'll give it one more try. Can you see now? Yeah, that's perfect. We can see a spotlight. Okay, good. So there seems to be a gradient from there, the inside of the tumor, to there, the outside of the tumor. Um, but we have to ask the question, where's the information? Who's making a gradient? And you can express it in a stupider way, if you like, which is to say, why does a body make gradients across a melanoma? in order for the melanoma to spread and to kill you? Um, and the answer, of course, is the body does not make gradients. And we showed this by going and doing a control for this assay that I've shown you, where instead of putting um, high serum here and low serum here, we put exactly the same medium everywhere with high serum in it. And we only put the cells there and lo and behold, you get exactly the same result. So when we've been doing that assay and looking at the cells responding to the gradient, they're not actually responding to the gradient we've given them. They're responding to a gradient that they're making themselves. How do they make a gradient? Well, it turns out that the chemoattractant, I won't go into the details, is a molecule called LPA, lysophosphatidic acid. And if you look at what melanoma cells do to LPA, a dish of melanoma cells in medium that doesn't have any LPA doesn't make any. But if you put a low density of cells in a dish that does have LPA with serum or, some, uh, or a dish of high density cells, you see that the cells break down the LPA very, very quickly. So there is a gradient of LPA that is high outside the tumor and low inside the tumor. And the reason you have a gradient is that LPA is happening generally, but where there's a tumor, they break it all down and kill it. So the cells make a gradient from where the tumor is to where the tumor is not. And that's where the self-generated gradient comes from. We say self-generated because the cells give attacks to the gradient and they generate the gradient and they do it simultaneously. Now this process that I've um, described to you here um, can be shown in, a, in an agent-based model here done by Luke Tweedy, uh, where we show the uh, uh, homogeneous attractant in red, and we put cells there in the left, and then we run a gradient in which the cells, well, a simulation, sorry, in which the cells break down the red attractant, the red attractant diffuses, the cells migrate up the resulting gradient, and there you go. And what you see is exactly, more or less perfectly exactly, depending on the parameters, what we saw in that assay. A wave of cells moving up the leading edge, and a bunch of cells behind that are not very directed. And you suddenly see from this model that the reason the cells behind the edge are not very directed um, is that the cells that are migrating, as well as generating the gradient, have eaten it all up. They've broken every molecule down in it. And Luke actually showed analytically, um, some of you may have seen his talk earlier this morning, um, he showed analytically um, by using a, a, a variant of the Stefan uh, equations um, that actually it's inevitable. There will always be exactly enough cells there to break down all of the gradient. So the initial conditions, which we found to be true biologically again and again, are you have lots of attractant everywhere. It doesn't need to be in a gradient. It can be. 
I showed you an assay where we started in a gradient, and I showed you an assay where it didn't start in a gradient. And again, the information is always coming from the cells themselves. So you get something that's extremely dynamic. If the cells stopped breaking down the attractant, the red would swarm all over the screen very quickly, and the local gradient would break would cease. Um, it's complex. You can see all sorts of stuff happening, despite the simplicity of the conception. And it's very, very interesting, as well as important. And again, if we look at those melanoblasts um, in the developing mouse, you see exactly the same thing. The melanoblasts at the front, shown in red in this thing here, in this representation here, are moving in a directed way down the mouse's arm, the embryonic mouse's arm. Uh, and the ones that are further back are not because the ones that are moving down the arm have broken it down. Um, and actually, um, this seems to happen everywhere. Whenever we look at chemotaxis, we see features that tell us um, that it's not the simple gradient that everyone tends to study, um, uh, but it's a self-generated gradient. And this, this is a mathematical biologist's paradise. Um, um, uh, you folk in the SMB should be rejoicing because this gives you such an advantage over the uh, biologists that don't have maths and don't have math collaborators. Um, you've got positive feedback. You've got negative feedback. You've got local instabilities. They're all acting at the same time. It's beautiful. It works at a multi-scale level. Single cells are breaking down the attractant, but groups of cells and waves of cells um, are behaving differently. You've got emergent properties. There is nowhere where a wave is coded into all of this, but those waves emerge. We have seen a number of other emergent properties. It's lovely. Um, and above all, if you try and study what is going on with equations and models, you will understand it. If you try and use your insight and say, well, those cells, uh, I think I know what they're going to do, you'll be wrong. You'll never understand the instabilities. You'll never understand the feedback. One of the biggest troubles we've had since we've started working on self-generated gradients is referees who are biologists telling us this cannot be true. If the cells break down the attractant, there's no attractant there. So the cells can't keep attacks. Um, we have this again and again and again, most recently in the paper showing the mazes, where one of our referees said, I am sure this is not true. But it is, because it happens. But that's what you get if you study biology using math, rather than studying biology by just using words. Uh, Lord Kelvin said it best. Anyhow, it turns out this process of self-generated chemotaxis um, was first published in 1966. I gave a talk about a whole load of findings about a year and a half ago in a microbiology meeting. Um, and some of the microbiologists said, um, uh, you talked about it in bacteria. But did you know that the guy who published this paper, Julius Adler, is still um, running a lab in Wisconsin? And so immediately following this talk, um, I had a talk by telephone with Julius Adler, who published the first description that I know of, of self-generated gradients, um, when I was not yet one. I was alive, but not yet one. And we had a nice conversation, and he was very pleased it was all coming back again. Julius Adler showed this thing. He showed that if you inoculate bacteria into the middle of a plate, uh, where the agar was a simple agar in which the only chemoattractant present was galactose, and that was the, the, the source of energy that the bacteria needed, um, they would form a ring. And that ring is exactly the same as the wave I showed you uh, in Luke's uh, uh, model. In front of that ring, there is lots of galactose. And behind that ring, there is none at all. And amusingly, if you go and use a rich agar, like the sort of LB agar that we use, you see multiple rings. And tryptone agar, for example, you see exactly three rings. You see the front ring on the outside, and that's serine, which is the strongest chemoattractant. And behind that, you see a ring that's driven by aspartate. And behind that, you see a ring that's driven by threonine. 
each of those rings is being driven by a wave of chemotaxic, chemotaxing bacteria. Uh, and it looks just the same as the ones that I showed you the melanoma cells doing, uh, only much smaller. So we see it in amoebas, we see it in, I'll show you some of them in a moment, we see it in bacteria, we see it in cancer cells. Why would cells want to go and use this system? Uh, well, there are lots actually. Um, let me show you um, with a different model um, why self-sharinated uh, gradients might be very robust. So in the top here, we're going to look at some cells responding to a normal gradient. So we'll put the cells there, we'll put the chemoattractant there, and we'll let everything evolve. And the cells start off brilliantly, but as they get further and further along the gradient, they do less and less well. And this is obvious. It's happening because the signal to noise ratio is going down. At the beginning, the, the cells had no chemoattractant behind them and some chemoattractant in front of them, so it's simple. As they get to the middle, they have some chemoattractant in front of them and nearly the same, just a wee bit less chemoattractant behind them, so it's harder to read. You also have an issue of um, saturation, which must happen because they use receptors, um, but more of that later. Now, by contrast, let's look at what happens if the cells break down the attractant as they move it. The signal to noise remains colossal because always in front of that wave of cells, you have a high concentration of attractant. Always behind the wave of cells, you have a low chemoattractant. Um, and the cells always position themselves in the place where the gradient is at its steepest because they're doing it dynamically and because they can. So the self-generated gradient gives you much more robust chemotaxis than a normal gradient can, especially when the concentrations get high. And what that means, if you go and work it out, is that any time you see a chemotactic gradient, if it's more than half a millimeter long, and certainly if it's more than one millimeter long, it cannot be mediated um, by a st static uh, gradient of chemoattractant. The cells must somehow be generating and respond to it and making a local sharpened gradient. This point isn't exclusive. If you have a little gradient, the cells can make it too. But if you have a big, long gradient above half a millimeter, then you may be certain that the cells have joined in in making it. Um, uh, and, and, and that's interesting. Um, here we're just showing this. Actually, I'm going a little bit slowly, so I'm going to rush through this, except to show you that Luke built a one centimeter long gradient, and the cells are doing just as well at the end as they were at the beginning. Now, when you get complex paths, this starts getting more interesting. Um, so this, I won't show the movie. Um, this is just showing a static chemoattractant uh, uh, path with two mazes. And obviously those cells that you can see there at the start um, are going to move randomly, either up the top branch or the bottom branch. But if you get a self-generated branch like that, then the cells do not move randomly, they move robustly. Uh, and the reason they choose robustly, I should say, and the reason for that is that if slightly more cells take the top branch, then the concentration of chemoattractant will go down in the top branch, and the concentration of chemoattractant will go up in the bottom branch relatively, and the bottom branch will have a relatively steeper gradient, so it will recruit more cells. Uh, and Luke measured this, and lo and behold, the predicted uh, choices of cells, if they were to choose randomly, are shown by the red dots as a binomial distribution. Uh, and the cells in a two-path self-generated maze um, decide much more closely to 50-50 um, than the binomial distribution would predict. Now, you can't see this because some window, I don't think you can anyhow, because something's gone. But saying we change this a little bit more and make the top branch of this maze not connected to a source of chemoattractant, but the bottom branch, yes, connected to a source. What you're going to see then is the cells will split. But once the cells have split, 
then the lower one becomes more attractive. It has a higher concentration of attractant and more cells go down that way. Uh, and that's interesting, but not surprising. But what is surprising, if you're just using intuition again, is that if you get a point where the closed branch becomes shorter, then you reach a point when most of the cells never go down it at all. They can all tell that the lower branch is the correct one to go down. So they've actually, by using a self-generated gradient, uh, detected that the top branch is no good without going down it. The cells have seen round corners. And in this model here, you can see you can build it into a maze. You can build it into a maze of arbitrary complexity. Um, but if the outlet is connected to a source of attractant and the other branches aren't, then the cells will choose correctly. And they'll choose correctly, basically, every time. Because they are locally creating gradients, and the branches that are connected to the outside world create steeper gradients than the ones that are not. Um, and now I'm talking to a very mathy audience. When I'm talking to biology audiences, um, I make them say, before I show any of these slides, I make them give me a show of hands, and I make them tell me how many believe um, that I can prove a biological hypothesis using a computational model. And I typically get 25% of polite people saying I can, and 50 to 70% saying I can't. Um, but then I show them this. And when I've shown them this, I say, so who thought that my model proved the case now? And I can prove some of them. But you must understand, because it's really important, the reason that models are unpopular in some areas of biology um, is John von Neumann's observation that if you have enough parameters, you can model anything you like. But in these cases, the model is what we did, and then we built the maze according to what worked in the model. We knew that the biology was going to work before we ever did any experiments because the model told us so. And this process, this, this maze solving, it's unbelievably biologically relevant. Uh, if you think about a neutrophil in your blood vessels that is trying to get to an infection in the tips of your fingers because you've, you've cut yourself, um, then the process of working your way between the endothelial cells and between all the other cells uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the body uh, and through the matrix and to find the infection in the dermis, it's one of these mazes. It's the same thing. And when you're an embryo, well, I've shown you, haven't I? The melanoblasts, for example, have to do more or less the same thing. What they're doing is squeezing their way between all the other things and finding a complex path to try and find the source of where there was more attractant. It's exactly the same with germ cells. And in fact, one of the only um, cell, uh, mutants that has been described that makes germ cells go wrong is a mutation called Wunen, in which the Drosophila germ cells never find the gonad. Uh, so you make a gonad, but the germ cells have wandered off somewhere else. And that is because the germ cells cannot break down the chemo tract. And when nerves um, pathfind, uh, it is believed that they use chemo attractant, but a process as complex uh, and detailed as neural pathfinding isn't going to work with a great wash of uh, chemo attractant. It's going to be something detailed, and the only way you can get the sort of local gradients that will be needed will be by this sort of thing, etc., etc., etc. Wherever we look in biology for chemotaxis, we find that self-generated chemotaxis will do better than other kinds. And if you look at a more complex maze, you see more complex responses. You see that initially cells take the wrong route. And then as time evolves, more and more of them take the right route. And again, reality does exactly the same thing. Initially, lots of cells go down, but by now, all the cells are going up. And it turns out when you go and study it, that one of the key parameters in this is actually the diffusivity of the attractant. And this is really interesting to us because uh, biologists who study chemotaxis um, always neglect the diffusivity of the attractant. And they always neglect it because when you study it 
in a static gradient in those chambers I showed you, um, the diffusion of the attractant is much faster than the moving of the cells. Um, and so you can neglect diffusion. Uh, but in these real biological circumstances, when the cells are breaking down the attractant and self-generating the gradient, the diffusivity changes everything. It may even be the most important parameter. And what you see in this heat map down here um, is that when you have um, a very highly diffusive attractant, the cells are always perfect, as shown here, because they can very quickly denude um, the maze, all the wrong bits from attractant, uh, and it very quickly gets refilled. And if you have a very high diffusion coefficient, then actually what you get is the cells never retracing their paths, but they also can't see around corners anymore, because the only way they can see around corners is if stuff diffuses around the corners, and if the diffusion coefficient is zero, then nothing's diffusing around the corners. Um, but here's an interesting thing. There is a magic area within this graph where actually the cells do a little bit less well than 50-50. And that's really extraordinary. No one predicted that. Um, but it turns out that the point is, um, uh, it's the flux of chemoattractant that is most important. Um, and this structure here with the multiple branches gives you a more rapid flux of chemoattractant for a short while before it's depleted. And that more rapid flux attracts more cells. And that made, allowed us to make an easy maze and a difficult maze. And this is great fun because one of these mazes is easy and one of these mazes is difficult. And I'm not going to tell you which. While I take a sip of my tea, you can all look at it and you can all mentally ask yourselves which of these is the easy maze and which is the hard one. Um, and I hope you've now um, answered it. And the answer is that um, the decisions that the ones on the left are making are always between little branches and a long correct one. And the de decisions that the one on the right are making are between two very large areas. So let's start it again. That first decision those cells are making are between this big area here, which has a branch near it. So there'll be a high flux, even though that's a wrong term. And this one here is very long, so the flux will be a bit lower. And so lots of the cells will go the wrong way here initially. And that's what you've seen. Whereas in the other maze, nearly always, nearly all the cells go the right way. And that's what you see in the real world. We've made lots of mazes. Um, and the interesting thing is when the mazes the real mazes don't agree with the models. It's because we've missed a bit of biology that we should have been studying, and we keep adding bits of biology um, as a result. It's been terrific fun, as I've said. Um, all of this work um, is out in science this month, um, so please read and enjoy it, um, and you can see lots more uh, stuff than I've talked about now. Now, I only have a little bit of time to talk about negative gradients, so I'm going to go quite fast, negative chemotaxis. Um, but I did think you'd all enjoy it. Um, it's another case where a mathematical understanding reflects reality much better than a verbal understanding. So here we are. Um, we were trying to explain, with models, a paper that showed that um, sometimes single cells chemotax correctly, upper gradient, and sometimes single cells incorrectly tend to go the wrong way upper gradient. And they go the wrong way, particularly when the concentration is very high. And we said, oh, very high concentrations. We know what that means. That means a self-generated gradient. Now, how could that work? Um, well, let's first consider why reverse chemotaxis is hard. We know that bacteria are very happy to chemotax down a gradient of something they don't like. Nickel ions, for example, or phenol, those two things, bacteria very happily chemotax from high concentrations to lower concentrations. Now that's really hard for a eukaryotic cell to do. Why? Well, E. coli has exactly five receptors. It doesn't have six receptors. Um, all of the receptors are known. And if you take out all five receptors, the E. coli are not 
hematactic at all. That is all. Eukaryotes have thousands, absolutely thousands. So it's quite easy to get negative information out of one of five receptors. But when you have thousands, if they're all feeding negative signals in as well as positive, then your signal to noise ratio will become horrible because every receptor will be giving you a noisy signal and it won't work. And probably because of that, nearly all receptors from eukaryotes act positively. That is to say, if there's no attractant, nothing happens. Um, if there is an attractant, then they transduce a signal into the cell. Second thing you must remember whenever you're talking about things like chemotaxis is that it always goes through receptors and receptors are the only way that information goes from outside the cell to inside the cell. So if you have something like a hormone outside the cell, the top here is always outside, then the hormone binds to a receptor, shown in red. The hormone bound receptor changes things like G proteins and the G proteins change something inside the cell and another signal is released. All the information has to go through that. And if you neglect that, which lots of biologists do and lots of mathematicians do, Hans Meinhardt's explanations of chemotaxis uh, miss this and it actually makes them faulty. They're pretty good fun, but they're faulty. Uh, if you miss this fact about receptors, um, then you don't understand chemotaxis. Uh, and receptors are saturable. Um, uh, if you give them rather more chemoattractant than uh, uh, their um, diffusion, than, than their midpoint um, uh, uh, dissociation constant, um, then you don't get any more information by adding more attractant to them. So the hypothesis is that the way negative chemotaxis is working is it's taking receptors that are being filled by some other ligand somewhere uh, and it's getting competition with them. What do I mean? I mean, if you have a huge gradient of attractant, um, then you get a gradient of active receptors, but up there at the top, there's no gradient because the receptors are all saturated, so there's no rate of change. Um, if you have a gradient of an inhibitor, it binds to the receptors, but it doesn't cause anything to happen. So you have no gradient of active receptors. But if you have both of them present at the same time, uh, with the attractant there everywhere and the inhibitor there in a gradient, then where the inhibitor is low, you get a lot of active receptors. And where the gradient is high, you get few active receptors. Would that work? Could that happen in reality? It's lovely when I draw it to you with, with PowerPoint graphs. Well, here are some dictyostelium cells. And here's what happens if you put a flat gradient of chemoattractant on them. Nothing. And here's what happens if you put a steep gradient of what is thought to be a chemo repellent on them, CPT counts. Low here and high here. Again, you see nothing. It's a different nothing. These cells don't move. They don't like the attractant but they're certainly not going backwards. They're certainly not repelled. But when you mix the flat chemoattractant uh, and the gradient of the repellent, you see extreme active repulsion. The cells fly away from the high end of the repulsion. So yes, it can not only work in reality, it can work brilliantly in reality. Should I call that negative chemotaxis? Well, it's a bit semantic, isn't it? Whether it's positive chemotaxis that's backwards or negative chemotaxis that's forwards. Um, but let's say it's negative chemotaxis, it's chemotaxis down a gradient because that's what you see from the point of view of the ligand. Um, so we took a needle, uh, and this is Adam who I showed you before's work, and we put a known chemo repellent in it. And it doesn't work very well. But if you then add a background, uh, an even background of a chemoattractant that can't be broken down in, then suddenly the cells fly away from the needle. So yes, um, this mathematically driven process can explain chemorepulsion. And the really fun thing comes, and this is what I'm going to leave you with, when you have interacting gradients. So if you have an interacting gradient um, 
where you have um, homogeneous attractant uh, and a gradient of um, chemo repellent, um, but the attractant is degradable, then on the right hand side, um, you get a steepened gradient of attractant and the cells will go towards it. But on the left hand side, you get efficient chemo repulsion and so the cells go away. Cooler still, if the repellent is degradable and the attractant is not degradable, you get exactly the, exactly the opposite thing happening. You get a steepened gradient of repellent at the right, so the cells are driven leftwards, uh, and you get a flat gradient at the left, so the cells are driven towards the attractant, and they bump in the middle. And you can actually use where the midpoint is formed to make an analytical solution for what the ratio of the dissociation coefficients of the attractant and the repellent are. The most counterintuitive and the coolest thing out of this, which really shows that math is right and intuition is wrong, comes if you have incomplete agonists. So you have two agonists and neither of these agonists causes 100% of the receptors they bind to to be activated. And a steeper gradient is present of the worse agonist, and a shallower gradient is present of the less good agonist. And what you see then um, is each of the two gradients on their own is predicted to give you weak chemotaxis. And in each case, it's a static gradient, so it's predicted to be stronger, as always, at the lower end. But when you mix them together, you expect it to become repulsive. You see this is all below zero. And lo and behold, that is what we measure when we do it in renal cells. Uh, and I can leave you with videos of cells moving up a gradient. It's high on this side of SP camps. And cells moving up a gradient. It's high on this side of RP camps. A little bit more random here, but you can see that they are all moving that way. And then when you mix them together, you can see because they're all pointing which way they're going to go. Exactly the same concentrations, everything mixed together. And now the cells reverse. So I'm going to come to two conclusions and then uh, I've had my time and I'll see if anyone has any questions. Because it's an SMB meeting, I'm going to come to some conclusions about mathematical biology. Um, and I hope you come to the same conclusion as me looking at all of this. If you're a mathematician, you need to find biologists with cool problems, and you can probably answer a whole load of stuff that they can't, and it'll be very good fun. If you're a biologist, then you need to take your problem to a mathematician and stop using words all the time, because a collaboration between mathematicians and biologists will find real, complex, emergent answers rather than verbal answers which are weak. We need each other, and it's good that we need each other. Finally, some conclusions about chemotaxis as we watch some cells finding their way through Hampton Court maze here. The first one is that it is nuts to consider chemotaxis as a static phenomenon. Attractants change the way cells behave, and cells change the way attractants behave, and it's dynamic. It's dynamic in space and it's dynamic in time. And if you want to understand chemotaxis, you have to understand those dynamics. Secondly, it's complicated. It's obviously complicated. Um, I'm amazed that mathematical biologists often have the same weakness as wet biologists and try and simplify everything. These complex answers are brilliant. And when we have found things to be more complex, we have gone and sh changed the models and found more simple biology. It's wonderful. Uh, and seek emergent properties too. Emergent properties are more interesting than simple intuitive things. Uh, and with those lessons, I will leave you. Um, and thank you all very much for listening. It's been a very fine meeting and a very great pleasure.
Great. Uh, thanks for the excellent talk. It's very interesting. Very interesting videos. Um, so we have a couple of questions uh, coming in the chat and also in the Q&A. So I'll just start from the top. Um, it says, do you think one could use this for clinical application? For example, could you exploit this behavior to prevent a limit metastasis by luring the cancer cells into an artificial local source of... Oh, good. Um, every time I give this talk, that's, uh, who asked that? Uh, that's good. Um, I'll, I'll look afterwards. Um, so every time I give this talk, um, particularly to medics, they say, can we stop the gradient? And the answer is self-generated hemotaxis is stupidly robust. Um, if you inhibit 90% of it, um, it makes no difference at all. If you inhibit 90% of the receptors or the ability of cells to break down the enzyme, it makes no difference. The whole thing is full of feedback and it slows down a bit. But if you make an alternative attractant, um, then you can fool it. So this is no use at all for melanoma, unfortunately, because in melanoma, what a good doctor does is just chop the melanoma out. No point fooling around with chemoattractants, just cut it. Um, surgeons like melanoma much more than mathematicians. Just chop it out and don't think is surgeon language. Um, but um, there are tumors like glioblastoma Glioblastoma is very highly chemotactic, and you can't chop all of glioblastoma out because it is so chemotactic that you would have to chop out nearly all of the patient's brain. Uh, and yes, we would dearly love to make a dummy chemoattractant self-generated system so that uh, uh, patients with glioblastoma, we can attract the cells back in rather than letting them go out and doing it. So thank you very much. Actually, that's the first time someone's asked that question the right way around first time. Great. Uh, so another question is, uh, in some of the simulations, the cells seem to have a non-spherical shape. Is that just to visualize a velocity or part of the model implementation? Um, we use lots of different simulations for different reasons. Um, and in order to simulate the mazes, we had to simulate cells with a persistence. Real cells have a persistence, and the persistence we used um, came from parameters from measured cells. Um, but if you just do it with random migration, it doesn't work as well. So when you saw random cells, when you saw round cells, sorry, they are just moving with a biased random walk. Um, whereas um, when you see the, uh, the oblongs, they are moving with a persistent biased random walk. Um, and um, it's not actually deliberately, we're not being rigorous about that. It just uh, reminds us what we're doing. So again, a good question, and, and, um, but we use, we use um, all the different models we can find under the sun, um, because every different scale you work on, and every different cell number you work on, every different question you ask on, needs a different shape of modeling to give you the best answers. All right, thank you. Uh, another follow-up question said, have you compared your simulations with keller siegel type PD models? Do they give the same predictions when solved in mazes? Um, we have um, compared, um, I don't know if in the latest incarnation we've looked at Keller Siegel um, Goldberg uh, driven models. Um, we have in the past um, done it. And the answer is you can get similar behavior. Um, but our um, um, hybrid um, um, agent based models are essentially perfect. And other models we've tried are. They do the same sort of thing. Uh, now, the really interesting thing um, comes when you start considering the difference between the cells creating a chemo repellent um, and cells breaking down a chemo attractant. Um, Hans Meinhardt, when he worked on this, said that they were exactly identical, uh, but they're not. And they're not because when the receptors get saturated, they start giving different um, uh, uh, properties. Uh, and actually, the most interesting properties always seem to happen near receptor saturation. So the answer is, um, uh, we have tried many different formulations of the math. Um, and um, uh, the one I'm showing you is the best for the cells we're using. Um, other cells will probably require different ones. I don't think glioblastoma is going to work the same way. I think we'll probably have to simulate that with a, a, a different process. All right, um, two questions from Sandy. It says, do more mutated cells 
uh, for example, more aggressive melanocytes have stronger chemotactic responses, <laughs> or at least different. Sub-question, uh, are the leading clusters different from those that lag? Um, two uh, questions. The first question cost us unending grief with referees. So the answer is um, yes and no. And it caused us an ending grief with referees because referees, again, were trying to do it with words rather than equations. And referees wanted metastatic cells to be chemotactic and non-metastatic cells to be non-chemotactic. Uh, and that was not true. We found pretty much all cells were chemotactic. But the most chemotactic ones metastasized first. Um, so again, you have asked the question in the correct way, well done. Um, the metastatic ones are more chemotactic. But if you ablated all the most chemotactic ones, um, then you get a wave of metastasis a week later from somewhat less metastatic ones, um, and so on and so forth. We never managed to find a melanoma cell line that was not chemotactic. And we think that's because actually the way you, the, the a melanoma probably forms if the cells think they're a melanoblast again. And I showed you that movie showing what melanoblasts do. They spread. They spread from where they are now to somewhere else where they are. That's what their job is. Um, so um, yes, the most chemotactic ones spread the fastest. Um, and you get some quite interesting partitioning. Again, you get some quite interesting math if you look at what happens in a, a population of mixed chemoattraction, or even more interesting, a population of mixed breakdown, because they sort, but they sort in a much more complicated way. Um, sorry, what's the second question? I've been carried away by my own words. Sub question was, are the leading clusters different from those that lag? Um, yeah, yes, they are more chemotactic, um, or they are breaking down themselves more. And now I think about it, um, we have never done a simulation in which we changed both chemotactic sensitivity, and also the efficiency of breakdown of the attractant. And I think we probably better have, don't you? I mean, something interesting and emergent is going to come out of that. I better follow my own rules. So um, uh, let's heat up a computer this evening. All right, thanks. Um, so we're going to combine two questions from the chat here. Uh, somebody asked, is the gap behind the initial wave of migrating cells reproducible in simulations? It looked from the visualization or simulation that there was an initial wave a gap and then a higher density of wandering cells behind. And then somebody also asked, are those left behind cells still doing chemotaxis or diffusively spreading behind the moving pulse? Um, so the second question, the second answer is right. The ones behind are moving randomly. And in the sort of scales we're talking about, actually random migration is completely useless. So they're going nowhere. Um, uh, um, and the same scale of the ones that are migrating. So actually um, the uh, numbers of cells in the front wave and the relative number of cells completely change depending on the parameters of the simulation or the conditions of the experiment. So if you take a fixed chunk of agar and put cells at one edge, then you get a wave formed and then cells drop out of it because there's less and less attractant as the cells break it down. And as there's less and less attractant, you need fewer and fewer cells in the wave to deal with the flux that's coming in. And so cells get left behind. And it's really beautiful. They get left behind stochastically, but the moment they get stochastically left behind more than a certain amount, the wave kicks their butts and then moves on and they're lost. And you see it's very anthropomorphic. You feel terribly sorry for the cells that are getting left behind. Um, you think about baby ducks and baby elephants and nature movies and so forth. Um, if instead of having just a block of agar, you have a source of attractant, um, then the wave has to be the same size because the flux, if anything, gets a little bit bigger. And if you do the thing in 2D where the cells are in a hole in the middle and they come outwards, then you need more and more cells in the wave. They either have to divide or recruit more cells or the wave fails at a certain point because they can't break that. So the, 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 the exact nature of the wave is very, very interesting. And if the amount of attractants is subsaturating, then you may not get a wave at all because just one or two cells may be enough to break down all the attractant that's there. It's very, it's very interesting area for study. Uh, really interesting. So I, we're technically out of time, but I don't think we have anything after this scheduled in the meeting. So if it's okay with you, uh, Robert, um, I'm happy to, to stay here, so long as you don't mind me drinking tea every now and then.
All right. Um, so we'll just keep going with the questions then, if that's okay yeah. with the organizers. Um, so Erica asks, where do the chemo repellents come from in the natural environment? Do cells themselves produce them? Do the producing cells ah. get self-repelled? Ah, I suppose I should have expected good questions from a meeting like this. Um, uh, the, the answer is probably um, yes. Um, the answer is in real biological situations, you probably see all sorts of stuff going on. So in the condition of um, cells chasing um, an infection, immune cells chasing an infection, then you get something quite complicated where you get a few leader cells, which are probably neutrophils, arrive. And the neutrophils bang out all sorts of gradients. Um, and cells like macrophages both re and interact with those gradients that the neutrophils have made while also banging out uh, gradients of their own. Um, in the um, uh, melanoblasts moving in the, um, uh, in the embryo, it seems likely that all of the cells in the dermis, or a fixed subset of the cells in the dermis, are constantly making the attractants at a low level rate. So the stuff that's at the end of the fingers, whether it takes them a few days for the monoblast to go, they probably accumulate quite a lot. Um, but if the monoblasts arrive a bit early, it's not a problem. Um, they have less stuff made, uh, uh, but they still have it. Um, uh, I'm sure in in Dictyostelium, um, the cells are making their own attractants as well as breaking down their own attractants. And that, of course, is where Keller Siegel um, uh, comes in. Um, and um, that gives you a different behavior um, involving um, some very elegant waves. The waves tend to scroll waves. I think Case Vaughan, um, who is an SMP member, has studied them the most beautifully, but two or three others have. Um, so all, all sorts of different places you can get attracted from. It doesn't really matter because the, 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 the place where the most interest happens is in this interface um, between the wave of cells and the, the attractant wherever it is. Great. So um, I guess that a little bit answers this next question. It says, is there a gradient of chemotactic responsiveness in melanoma? For example, are there other tumor cells better at producing the self gradient than others? Well, well I, I've, um, um, I, I can only answer that by modeling. The, the ethics in getting chunks of, of melanoma out of patients are really um, tricky. We thought we had done it. We thought that we had agreed finally with a doctor to get ethics um, there is a particular case where people have a particular kind of secondary metastatic melanoma, um, where the metastases are removed to ease the patient's um, suffering. Uh, and we thought we had an agreement that we would get a surgeon to chop some of them out, um, and we could go and look at all the cells all the way along. Um, but unfortunately, it was murder to get ethics for it, and by the time we got ethics for it, the physician, the surgeon, left to go somewhere else. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, when, you, when you model it, um, you find that if you have um, uh, uh, populations that are divergent, um, then you get all sorts of sorting behaviors happening, and it's really rather nice. Um, and I've already resolved to go and do a new one following this um, talk, um, but uh, we would expect to see all sorts of sorting going on. Um. Okay, so then another question is, uh, do you know of any molecular species that can move by a self-generating gradient? This can be great for a targeted drug delivery as a cancer targeting drug attracted by oh. a status chemotaxis gradient gets mm. lost as the tumor dies and the signal becomes too weak. Yeah, uh, it's a very interesting question. No, no, um, I haven't thought um, much in those terms. One of, the, one of the nice things about this um, is that the moment you start following any question like that, there's always a lifetime of research to do. Um, I can see about 23 um, lifetimes of research. Um, that would be a 24th, um, I guess. Um, yes, you could, um, uh, if, if you had a, a, a molecular species, it'd have to be rather a complicated thing, but if you could make a molecular species do that, then yes, you could chase it around the body in a way. I often wonder if the reason that some tumors um, don't attract immune cells and they evade the immune system is because the same self-generated gradient that they're using to spread themselves also repel immune cells. LPA, for example, will repel. I mean, LPA is very attractive to 
specific classes of immune cells. So if melanomas have a gradient of LPA that's high outside, then those classes of immune cells will be repelled from the melanomas, for example. Right. Um, so forgive me to the attendees, I'm trying to combine questions as um, Dr. Insall is answering them. Um, so another question is, um, a mix of sensing mechanisms could be considered infotaxis. What challenges could arise from this perspective? Yeah, well, that's a self-answering question, isn't it? Um, all manner of questions. Uh, if you could, yeah, there you are. There's another couple of, of research lifetimes. Um, the way that diffusion of um, chemoattractants, secretion of chemoattractants, breakdown of, chemo, uh, of chemoattractants, and God help us, the cells making their own, could, could give you an infinity of different scenarios, um, depending on, on, on just exactly what the cell needs to explore. Um, infotaxis is a nice word, we should, we should use that. In fact, you know what? Um, it's my, I've come to my office work, I'm going to write that down in the pen. That makes it real. Lewis Carroll, who was a mathematician, said that. If I write it down, it's real. Great. Um, so I'm just trying to follow the chat here. So it says, what is the difference in implementation between the persistent random walking cells and the random walking cells? Okay, what's the difference in? The persistent random walking cells and the random walking cells in the um, implementation. Very little. It's just that the, um, I mean, the, 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 uh, the differences in those modes of migration are that you go fa faster with a persistent random walk, and it it also has a bigger random component. It's not not ballistic, um, but it really makes very little difference to the models. We had to make the random walk some persistent in order to make the model perfectly recapitulate the reality, but it really doesn't change a whole hill. The models work fine um, either way. Right. So. The last question in the chat said, so why did the macrophage follow the bacteria in the first video shown? The macrophage and bacteria both follow the same chemoattractants? Um, the bacterium is swimming. And bacteria swimming is, is highly polarized and so forth. Uh, and um, if you want my opinion, it is not chemotaxis at all. And if you want to know why I think it's not chemotaxis, next time someone shows that movie, ask them why is the gap between the bacterium and the neutrophil always so consistent. I think what happened is that in 1950, whatever it was, they weren't using very high NA objectives and the objectives could not resolve the flagella of the bacteria. And I think the neutrophil's um, formal peptide receptors have caught one of the flagella of the bacteria. And so it's actually tied on around moving by chemotaxis. Um, that's just me hypothesizing. I have no evidence but i tell you what go back and look at that movie um uh, there's lots of copies of it around and see if you disagree with me if you do drop me an email all right i think um we just have one last question from sandy again um see if i can interpret this correctly it says is the skin milo not too noisy for melanocytes to see these signals clearly yeah um the the the, the, the that is exactly the point so i think that in the skin a gradient that is not self-generated would be unreadable. You think there is too much stuff going on. But what we think is happening is we think that the mel melanoblasts concentrate the signal to a 200 micron band in which the signal is saturating downwards of the band and there is nothing at all upwards of the band. Uh, and under those conditions, uh, then probably that signal is, has a high enough signal to noise ratio that it, it can drown out all the other crap that those cells are seeing. If you had any other kind of chemoattractant gradient, the question is obviously right. They couldn't do it. Wouldn't work. Um, so that's one of the reasons we think a self-generated gradient must be what is going on in the directed part of those cells. Right. Um, and then some questions that came through the chat and then Q and A. So is any thoughts about the intrinsic underlying mechanism of the self-generated gradient by intrinsic, I mean, intracellular? Uh -huh. um, in all these cases um, that I've shown you today, um, 
the um, mechanism that the gradient is generated is that the cells have an enzyme on their outside. Um, the um, melanoma cells, we found it, it's an uh, enzyme that chops the phosphate off LPA. The dictyostelium, it's been known forever, they have an extracellular phosphodesterase that cuts up cytochrome In the things that go through G proteins, we think that there's probably enough ligands um, that the mechanism is pretty much always an enzyme. And in fact, neutrophils are coated with enzymes that break down chemokines. Uh, and everyone knows neutrophils are coated with enzymes that break down chemokines, but everyone sort of uh, uh, sweeps it under the carpet. Now, when cells are chemotaxing towards growth factors, um, VEGF, like Phil Maney and Ruth Baker have done, um, EGF, um, which um, the only other nice case of a maze that, uh, that we've seen um, um, is done, so on and so forth. In those cases, um, there are actually very, very few molecules in the gradient, and the cells endocytose the molecules as they read them. So in growth factor gradients, the cells are probably creating the gradient by endocytosing the ligand as they, as they read it. Um, but in all the ones I showed, it's, it's an enzyme. All right, I think that uh, that does it for the questions, as far as I can tell. There's plenty, um, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, thank you so much again for a great presentation, insights for the, uh, all the audience's questions. So sure. appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. I see 120 people still here, which is fantastic <laughs> to see all these questions. Thank you all. It's been the greatest of pleasures, and I very much enjoyed Someone's raised a hand. Do you know, can you see how to do that? Anything? Oh. Uh, I didn't see that. I have oh. no idea how to deal with the race. All right, let's see if this works. Allow to talk. Hello. Ah, oh, no, I must have been a while ago. Yep. Sorry, I missed that. No way. That's right. Um, he can he can email me if um if uh, uh, if you're still on, send me an email or I'll come to the uh, uh, the session for a bit. All right, sounds good. I think we'll sign off then. Thank you very much indeed. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Good, good night.